today on the Perception in Action podcast. Is there really one ideal gay strategy for performing a sports skill, as has been suggested by Quiet Eye Research? My interview with Ben Franks from Oxford Brookes University, looking at some of his research taking an ecological, individualized view of the quiet eye. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Okay, today my guest is Ben Franks. Uh, Thanks for joining me, Ben. No, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. So today we want to get into the quiet eye, you know, and I've I've, uh, talked about this a few times on the podcast. Of course, it's one of the most, if you're into motor learning and motor control, it's a pretty well-known effect. Um, so, but I thought I would start by asking, uh, Ben to, to give a ex- quick explanation for those that don't know what it is and kind of the traditional explanation for it. Yeah. So the quiet eye is a, I guess it's a particular perceptual variable, which explains perception action coupling quite nicely. So the quiet eye is essentially the final fixation we make with our eyes to a particular area in the visual field for 100 milliseconds or more, which leads directly to the start of our action for some kind of motor skill. So if we take base, baseball hitting, for example, you know, be the final fix as we make just before we start to make that kind of, I guess, a backswing mm-hmm. before we then go to struck the ball. So the, uh, it's, a, it's a very cognitivist concept. Kind of its, it's roots are from kind of, Jan Vickers' work in the mid nineties, um, and it's a, I guess it was a bit of an information processing tool, and it was a, a, a way that was captured to explain how visual information is used to build kind of representations or kind of internal models of a particular scene, um, and lead some way to predicting um, a response. And that's kind of changed as the years have gone on. I know. People like Sam Vine have done a lot of work on how quiet eye is a nice way to explain online control, for example. But traditionally, it's been conceived from a cognitivist mental model representation building mechanism based mm-hmm. on the visual information that we are kind of perceiving visually. Right. Yeah. And kind of the the traditional finding is this, you know, this quiet eye is longer, right, in more skilled performers. Yeah. And even people have shown it's longer on successful trials within the same yeah. performer. Yeah. And then, yeah, the idea that it's, it's um, reflecting some sort of planning, like uh, of the yeah. movement, uh, you know, motor programming or what, like you said, representation. And, and so, you know, I think uh, probably <laughs> both of us have had, this is not uh, this fight, this explanation and this result is not kind of fit nicely with the ecological dynamics approach does it can you can talk a little bit about kind of how you got into it and what you what your thoughts were yeah yeah so i the quiet uh, this is all from kind of my, my masters from a few years back um so i did a, a difference with standard master a master's by research mm-hmm. i guess it's like a it's, it's like a mini phd training program it's mm-hmm. a twenty thousand word thesis and then a viva at the end after two years of part-time study and initially I, I stumbled across it i've always been interested in kind of perception action coupling mm-hmm. i was a i am a failed goalkeeper in soccer or football um and yeah i stumbled upon the quiet eyes a nice way to explain 
how we perceive stuff. Um, and then my my undergraduate was quite predominantly focused on kind of ecological dynamics. So that's kind of how I came to that approach. And reading through the quiet eye literature, it's become quite messy in the last decade, I'd say, where that traditional finding of, you know, a longer quiet eye fixation, least success has been challenged. And then there's some work which started to say that you know, quiet eye fixation, which was too long, would lead to unsuccessful trials and then there's lots of stuff that said the quiet eye duration wasn't actually determinant of success and it's actually about the timing so it, it was quite a messy field I think but lots of really cool research I've really enjoyed getting into it particularly from a to challenge my own biases as an ecological based researcher mm-hmm. it's you know there's a lot of support from the quiet eye perspective for an information processing paradigm but my I guess my ecological approach to the quiet eye stemmed from uh, a 2016 target article with a load of responses and Keith Davis and Dwight uh, Arujo mm. both did a commentary challenging how traditional explanations of the quiet eye can explain how we actually come to attend to that specific visual information source which then supports action. Mm-hmm. I think that's where the strength of the ecological approach lies in how how one not so chooses, but calibrates to a particular information variable that supports action. And I mm. guess that's where my interest stemmed from. And then sort of a 2019 paper by Renshaw et al. on brain training models. Mm-hmm. We had a, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to contribute a small section on the quiet eye in that, which kind of introduced some of my thoughts to this area. And then obviously this recent paper has been one that's fleshed out a bit more considerably, particularly around uh, I guess some of the limitations of a cognitivist explanation of, of visual search behaviors mm-hmm. in terms of the traditional approach to generalizing group um, populations to a certain way or an optimal way of perceiving. Uh, I guess that's where the troubles I've found with the quiet eye is that there is an assumption at times that there's an optimal strategy of how we should perceive the world in front of us and how that then unlocks skill performance Mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of stemmed from there and then a little bit of my frustration with research in football or goalkeeping in particular didn't tell me much about goalkeeping (laughs) 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 there was lots of Gilt Gilt Savelsberg's work in Mm -hmm. at the uh, start of the 2000 2004 I think um, which used kind of 2D visual projections and then lots of penalty kick stuff and you know if anyone who's kind of watched soccer penalty kicks are are quite rare so it doesn't really tell us a great deal around skilled behavior Mm -hmm. so that's kind of where i thought well let's try and let's try and put the quiet eye into a into a real world scenario which is one of the benefits of the previous work on quiet eyes that it's always been really based in situ Mm -hmm. even starback as kind of the original work on the quiet eye was done on basketball free throwing but it was done on real life basketball yeah. free throw, which is mm-hmm. which is, I think one of the really nice concepts of it, and why I'm determined to build this ecological approach to Kohata. Yeah, and for sure, I, I think some of Joan's pictures should be like in a museum, <laughs> showing all the crazy equipment <laughs> she had to use. To she was determined, you know, it's going to be done on the court or on the ice, you know. <laughs> Um, she had to use some huge helmets and, you know, huge helmets. yeah, yeah. It reminds me a little, it reminds me a little, this is kind of what I thought when I started getting into like the focus of attention. Um, it's such a real, it's a very robust, like there's a kind of an ideal situation. Mm-hmm. It's a robust, consistent finding that doesn't have a good explanation. <laughs> That's like a, a good dream <laughs> for a researcher. Right. Um, and, um, but yeah, so I think, you know, you hit on the head there a lot, you know, it's all, it was almost getting to the one ideal solution kind of gaze research, right? You should look yeah. at the ball for 300 milliseconds before you start putting. Like that's the one way you have to do it, which is kind of, you know, obviously in the ecological approach, we, we kind of move away from, from that. Uh, the other thing I noticed, so I don't know if this is it, I, I find it kind of got convoluted where you went from the quiet eyes of fixation to like quiet eye tracking, like where you're, you're, that's a completely different kind of eye movement and function. Mm. The quiet eye of following a moving object, it does, that doesn't seem very <laughs> quiet to me. So yeah, I agree. It got very, and which is, which is good in a way. People started to dig into it, right? Instead of just repeating the same thing over and over. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I guess that's a little bit of my trouble with the concept still is that it's it's philosophically very cognitivist and the fact that there's mm-hmm. a very clear start and end point to the skill, which is how we then determine the quiet eye. Right. Whereas uh, I guess under an ecological event-based assumption, when does a skill start and end? Yeah. For sure. And I know it's like when you were you were trying to put in baseball context for me, I'm assuming you had a little trouble there, right? Because you're like, when when does the swing start? Right. Um, which is exactly that's the point, right? Um it's not like it's a lot, a lot of it early, especially the early ones were on golf putting, mm. pool shooting, where everything was still. <laughs> Even then though, yeah. you know. Um yeah, so I yeah I, I think uh, like I said I'm I'm glad someone's taken up this. I always kind of I like the area, but I was always kind of wishing there was t- some other work done. So, so you you mentioned you've done a few studies, but one the main one we want to focus on this kind of, you did a kind of a recent uh, one where you're looking at in goalkeeping, looking at more individual uh, yeah. quite. Uh, can you tell us a little bit kind of how this got started and their motivation? Yeah, so it was with my my masters with with Will, Robert, Will Roberts, um, and we wanted to, to to do some some kind of real representative task based design research. Um, a bit about of, out of frustration from previous goalkeeping research, a little bit around kind of really trying to capture an ecological approach to kind of task design and research. And initially, we'd intended on doing kind of looking at the quiet our behaviors in goalkeepers in in games in small sided mm-hmm. games um we quickly scrapped that idea um because it was just carnage um, <laughs> there was a, and it was too difficult to kind of classify um saves or tasks within that game mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in an organized fashion because right. every single kind of task or save the goalkeeper was making was from an entirely different situation and so it's just what we tried to strip it back a little bit and start with the, the penalty kick base research, which informed uh, some kind of really early work we did and presented at a few conferences where we compared the penalty kick research with the this new kind of dyadic task. And the dyadic task essentially is 1v1 to the goalkeeper and the shooter, but the shooter has more freedom to move. So it starts from the edge of the penalty box and they can carry the ball, dribble the ball into the area. Okay. And shoot by the time they get to the, the 12 yard line, essentially where the penalty spot would be. But they have that freedom to strike a moving ball when they can move a bit more freely. So we thought that captured what goalkeepers actually engage with in games. Mm-hmm. The fact that there's a moving ball and that the striker is more intentional in how they get to the, the end points and then make the shot go. And we found that there was really different quiet eye behaviors between the penalty kick and the, the representative task we designed. Mm-hmm. So for us, then it was a bit as a case of, well, if, if there's differences here, then maybe this is a better way to explain or start to understand what skilled performance is in goalkeepers. Mm-hmm. So we kind of ran away with this, this uh, representative task design and uh, wanted to look at it in, in elite goalkeeping and try to get the best population of individuals we possibly could. Now, obviously, goalkeepers are quite few in football teams. There tends to only be two or three. And football traditionally is a quite difficult environment to do research in. (laughs) So that's where a lot of the limitations of the study stemmed from in terms of limited participants and limited trials, Mm -hmm. just because getting access was tough. Um, Again, we wanted to keep it as representative as possible. So we used the training grounds of the clubs. We used their normal training times to collect the data and that comes with kind of those organizational constraints that, you know, if they, if they lose, they lost the game on Saturday and I was meant to be on a Monday, uh, tended to be that I wouldn't be doing any data that day. So there was, <laughs> there was, there was one time in particular, where they, they'd lost the game on the Saturday. I was meant to go in on the Monday to do some data and I spent the day with the, with the under 18s in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't allowed okay. to do any data that day. So that's why we adopted this case study approach rather than like a cross-sectional design or something a bit more intervention based. Just we wanted to just ha- have a bit of a look at what skilled goalkeepers do and take that kind of calculated risk of letting go of some of the experimental control to produce something that's a little bit more real, which mm-hmm. obviously came with its challenges from reviewers. Um, 
so yeah that's why we approached it the way we did and yeah we just wanted to see kind of the inherent variability that we see so we know that from an ecological perspective that noise is inherently good and it tends to be a feature of engaging with emerging task constraints during tasks mm-hmm. and we just wanted to just kind of see how that impacted it quiet art traditionally has been you know understood from this optimal perspective or grouping and averaging behaviors to to provide some understanding of well this is what expertise looks like but i just didn't feel comfortable with that approach i, I don't think it accurately reflects what's really going on in a performance environment mm-hmm. and so, so hence why we wanted to pursue inter and intra individual behavioral variability within the quiet eye to see if quiet eye was actually a feature of maintaining these perception action couplings in more dynamic um, interceptive based actions rather than the more traditional approach where it's been used before. Yeah, no, no, I like that a lot of it. And I think, um, you know, it's also kind of moving away from this, the kind of old, that skill is like perceive, decide, plan, act, right? Like you're in your scenario, I'm assuming they're, they're acting the whole time, right? The goalkeeper is free to move, yeah. they, you know, there's no, start of the movement <laughs> of the action and um which i'm sure makes it difficult so so they're wearing a mobile eye tracker the keeper yep, so it was a an smi eye tracking glasses which uh the company doesn't exist anymore so i can be quite brutal with the fact they were an absolute nightmare to work with <laughs> I bet, yeah I bet. they were they were uh, yeah i bet they, they weren't like the the kind of the, the toby pro mm. glasses which are quite small the the smi would were, were like a big pair of chunky glasses mm-hmm. um so yeah, we use eye tracking glasses, um, which obviously bears cameras in the in the rims of the glasses, which pick up the eyes, mm-hmm. um, and then a scene camera, which then maps the, the the point of reference onto the onto the scene camera to see where the goalkeepers were looking at those different times. Um, mm-hmm. And then we did a you know the traditional way of doing a quiet eye analysis with breaking down the goalkeepers' movement phases, um, and then actually kind of uh, based on the quiet eye, based on what they were looking at at the point they started that first movement toward the ball in okay. some kind of saving action, which is, again, really hard to determine because goalkeepers are alive and active. And if we go down the route of perspective control, mm-hmm. they're always they're always kind of acting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yep. determining the start of a, of a save phase was quite tough. Um, but but yeah. we, we you were using kind of the, the, di- the final ballistic whether it's a dive yeah or, so yeah. we uh, the if we tend to see in goalkeepers is they make this kind of hopping action mm-hmm. as they go to kind of get into their set position so we kind of use that as our as our reference point for what the start of the save is is that kind of first hopping movement to then make the save yeah and for uh, just for uh, uh you know i don't know if people know like so with a kind of an eye tracker like that what kind of you know, resolution. Can you tell like the, when they're looking at someone's shoulder versus their elbow versus, you know, that one's a pretty good one um, in terms of spatial resolution, right? No, yeah. they, they were, they were pretty good. The, the, the scene camera was good if the conditions are right. So it tends to be, if there was too much sun, right. the scene camera <laughs> wouldn't really pick up. And if it, there wasn't enough sun, then, but the actual resolution of the, of the images were, were, were actually quite effective. And we ended up using, the videos from the eye tracker for some kind of performance coaching kind of stuff with the goalkeepers as well. So okay. the, the, the quality of the, the footage was, was, was really impactful. Um, it's probably an under underexplored coaching tool as well in terms of helping goalkeepers understand what they're looking at and kind of what they're trying to pick up and that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, the, the glasses are quite temperamental at times and, very expensive so yes. reduced as possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i had the same we, we've done baseball ones at night here because the, there's way too much way too bright <laughs> um uh but yeah no yeah i think th- that's a good point that's another p- thing i think a uh, strength of the quiet eye is there's actually you know the work that like mark wilson and sam vine have done they show an actual training results like you train yeah. people to have a longer quiet eye you get uh, like they have a golf study where they actually show performance on the golf course, like true far transfer from quiet eye training. So I think that's good. Okay. So you did, um, you cut, so you kind of did this like almost a case study. It was on one particular goaltender or or a few. So we used four, four goalkeepers in total from, um, 
several different kind of professional football clubs. Mm-hmm. We the aim was to was to collect a lot more days than we did. Um, unfortunately, then a couple of the clubs I was in, the manager was sacked quite <laughs> soon. Quite soon after I'd first been in, mm-hmm. and getting back in under a new management was really difficult. So we were limited in how much data we collected. I think we only kind of got 120 trials across all four goalkeepers for mm-hmm. the paper itself. So we, we quite a small number, but I guess we remedied that with the fact we were doing a real deep dive into each individual goalkeeper. Okay. And we tried to do a bit more of a, a single subject design and really drill down into, into a trial by trial analysis to understand that variability that's present in these quiet type behaviors between the goalkeepers and within the goalkeepers. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I come from a psychophysics background in vision. That's how I was trained in you on depth perception motion. We do five subjects, 4 million trials, right? That's the way we use instead of now the big number of subjects and, you know, small trials. So, but, so I understand that that makes a lot of sense to me trying to dig in, especially if you're looking for these individual differences. So, so you, um, was the main variable you you started with the the final fixation before? Uh, you, I guess you can also you can define things relative to the person striking the ball, right? The attacker. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so this this I think is where the ecological approach is quite powerful in the sense that it appreciates that dyadic relationship a bit mm-hmm. more between the goalkeeper and the striker, but primarily it was the the quiet I was was really our sole focus alongside the movement phases of the goalkeeper. Um, ju- just to really try and focus on well, yeah. how do these perception action coupling behaviours manifest themselves mm. in the goalkeeper's performance? Um, and yeah, thank- thankfully, we-, we-, we found quite a lot of variability. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me from the paper is the fact that we didn't once see a trial which kind of reflected the mean of the group or the mean of the individual. Each okay. trial was kind of inherently unique in its own right. So if we'd have taken the traditional approach and grouped the behaviours, if we grouped the quiet eye behaviours, it wouldn't have actually reflected any of the individual trials that a goalkeeper engaged with. Okay. So this is where my, my difficulties with this assumed optimal quiet eye strategy comes. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't really exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. A, yeah. The um. So in, in, when you say variability, you're talking about. Are you talking about the duration, a, yes. and what so, and what they were looking at, or, or mostly just that? Yeah. So both. So the du- for the duration, we didn't find any any clear performance effect for the duration of the quiet eye. Okay. Between when it was when shots were saved and goals were conceded. There was no clear performance effect in the duration of the quiet eye, which, which is reflected in the more recent literature on the quiet eye. So it wasn't a particularly novel finding. It just kind of supports some previous work. The, in terms of the timing of the quiet eye, that's where I guess a bit more value was found. The fact that the timing of the quiet eye fixation was really quite heavily linked to the actual specific location they were placed in the quiet eye on. So we, we kind of, captured the quiet eye fixations were either at the ball or the visual pivot. So the ball being the literal ball, like they locked on the ball Mm -hmm. and that was where that kind of quiet eye fixation occurred or the visual pivot, which were were kind of roughly just below the knee of the kicking foot of the kicking striking leg. Um, So it kind of captured, I guess that kind of temporally related information around kind of foot to ball contact and the extension of the knee and rotation of the hips. So, yeah. And what we found is that goalkeepers who looked at the ball tended to onset their, their quiet eye fixation later okay. onto the ball, whereas goalkeepers who looked at the visual pivot tended to onset that fixation much earlier into the trial. So then when we tried to catch that against the movement phase of each goalkeeper, we, we found some speculative links and speculative because I don't think we have an, enough data and enough participants to really capture this and say, have a really strong empirical account of this, but we could start to speculate that goalkeepers that were had faster movement times and reaction times. So movement time was the literal time from 
when they started to make the save to the point they made contact with the ball. Mm -hmm. And then the reaction time was the phase between kind of the general hop phase Mm -hmm. and when they started that move. Okay. So two goalkeepers had kind of significantly kind of quicker movement times and reaction times, and they tended to, to fixate on the ball more frequently than the visual pivot. Okay. Whereas the goalkeepers with slower movement time and reaction times tended to look at this visual pivot area way more frequently. And I guess the argument that we put across from an ecological perspective was kind of it's grounded on, it must be grounded on their kind of action capabilities and mm-hmm. effectivities. As a faster goalkeeper, I know that I can wait longer yeah. for more for more specifying information to emerge in the trial, i.e. the ball, because it's far more telling of where the ball will end up because it's where yeah. it's going to go. Whereas a slower goalkeeper kind of has to try and pick up on these more peripheral information sources to prospectively control their actions in that kind of the, the earlier stages of the task so they can become more in line as the ball is then struck and that they're closer to where they need to be. Yeah. No, that makes total sense to me. Yeah, they, the, you know, they got to kind of cheat a little bit by picking mm. up information from the kinematics of the, right? And the pivot point idea is right. The, the idea you're looking at a spot like the knee, not because you care about the knee, <laughs> but that's just a convenient place to like park your eyes mm. so you can pick up from all different sources, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I yeah. Think- I think what's by faster and slower, like these are the most minuscule of time. Right. Like the, these are, they're all four goalkeepers were elite goalkeepers. So how we're capturing slower and faster is the most minuscule effect. But to me, it just demonstrated how four elite goalkeepers had variations in how they picked up information and acted on it, mm-hmm. but they were all still elite. So for me, that I think that's a really important one for me that, there's not a single way to be a skilled performer, that there is these inherent variabilities which which we find in in skilled performers, which must come from somewhere. Right. Uh, for me, it, it, uh, we suggested that it, you know, it resonates in kind of capturing affordances and the fact that certain information properties are, you know, more soliciting than others for goalkeepers based on their action capabilities at that particular moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree. There's lots of different ways you can save a ball, right? Like you, there's, you know, you can st- be completely still and wait to the last second and and move, or you know, to be make extreme examples, like and and then move, you know. Um, so yeah, I think that that that's a really interesting, um, you know, a way to think of it. That there's different kind of views and and there, you know, it it's kind of the demand, the demand, the the strat, the movement solution you have changes how you pick up information Mm. which changes where you look kind of idea yeah 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 i think that's you know i think that's interesting that's another problem i always had with the kind of the traditional explanation like especially like golf (laughs) like there's no information change it's the same (laughs) why do you need to look at it longer to tell that a stationary ball is (laughs) right um so so but i think that's uh, that's really interesting so um so you didn't, there was no, so they look at diff, two different places. There was no clear duration effect like the traditional quiet eye. Mm. Um, is that, if you, if you, do you think if you like did it in aggregate, would there be like an average, would there be a, like a, the, the, the usual findings? No. So, so we started off with more traditional statistical analysis mm-hmm. um, and there wasn't kind of an average difference between goals and saves across all goalkeepers. Mm-hmm. So the typical quiet, quiet hydration effect wasn't there. And perhaps it's a condition of the task itself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I guess in, in golf putting, there is, like you said, there's, there's not a lot else going on. <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, that duration being at the ball for that long period of time, it, where else is it going to be? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not, necessarily going to be darting around all over the place and i don't want to say that it's you know maybe it's a it's just there because it's a it happens to you know but eyes go to the ball there in the golf club because that's where the eyes need to be mm-hmm. it's, it wouldn't make sense to look elsewhere necessarily um but perhaps in a more dynamic or an interceptive task those quiet eye durations are probably more dependent on the constraints that are placed on the environment right 
and, and the timing of the duration rather than the duration itself. Right. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I think it's, a, it's interesting. I think, you know, I, you know, I, we almost take kind of an oversimplified view of, of gays <laughs> behavior, I think mm. in, in, you know, I think of something like, you know, we think it's just, you know, like the class that you perceive plan then move where I think it's more, you know, the class, the example I think of is like in driving, you know, when we go around the corner, we kind of look at the tangent point of a curve and it almost pulls us around. It almost somehow like it contributes to the control of the action other than just giving us information. It's kind of like a, you know, so it's, I think it, it's really interesting. I think that you're right. There's more to it than the, the kind of the way we, yeah. easy way we think about it in terms of fixations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm learning to drive at the moment and I, I definitely don't fixate my gaze. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's definitely something to having to educate my attention. A bit yeah. There's a good, um, I think it's um, John Juan and, and, and uh, um, Mike Land did a, why we look where we steer. Mm. Um, and they gave a really convincing model. That's just kind of, it helps the control of action beyond just picking up information. It's kind of just pull, mm. pulls you around almost. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that that's really interesting. So you mentioned you were kind of feeding this back to the players, the videos. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, it was a bit more, um, just kind of on the fly rather than anything planned or systematic. The goalkeeper just, they just took an interest and wanted to kind of see some of the feedback. And mm -hmm. one of the more, uh, I guess interesting things they were saying was that they thought they were looking somewhere else mm -hmm. than what the the data was telling them. So this almost it, they were more consciously thinking about you know something else that was occurring in the visual field, but their their actual fixations were resting elsewhere where they didn't think they were actually attending to. Mm -hmm. So that was quite an interesting one in terms of. Uh, I guess this pickup informa information may not be specific to what we think we're looking at. And it is probably something more around uh, we, we rest our fixations in certain areas to pick up a bit like the visual pivot. We rest it in that particular area to mm -hmm. pick up a whole host of things that are going on around it. And it might not be a conscious thing. It would much be a direct attachment we make with the environment. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think there's a point like, when we're talking about the control of action, like in so saving a soccer ball, we're talking about variables like tau and optic flow mm. and and movement that don't require central vision, right? They're, they're movement, but they, you can perceive them equally well, <laughs> unless you put it way, like we've done ex I did experiments a long time ago, unless you put it way out in your periphery, you can judge time to contact equally as well if you're looking at something right at something versus it's in your, so the, the idea that you have to fixate everything important is kind of a little, you know, not always true. And that, that's what we see in the, the pivot point and things too now. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. But um, yeah. So you were just kind of making them aware, uh, giving them a kind of awareness of where they looked and, and then not telling them you should do look at the ball. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah try, trying to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. Because uh, the, the quiet eye trading, aspect is really is a really interesting area which i've not really got myself stuck into yet mm -hmm. because i think as you mentioned at the start there's been some really quite considerable effects for quiet eye training mm -hmm. and kind of providing instructions around where to look and where to hold your fixation so that's a really interesting area which i think needs more attention um particularly from an ecological lens of how we explain that effect. And, and I think traditionally, obviously, the quiet eye training effect was done within the same task. So your pre-task, your quiet eye training, and your post-task would be the same tasks. Mm -hmm. Whereas now there's some work that's starting to bridge out into actual in-situ performance on a golf course, for example, Yeah, which I think needs an explanation. And I, I, I've always debated whether it's, is it, quiet eye training that's having these effects or is it actually like an attentional focus component which is causing these effects yeah because it's quiet eye training instructions are kind of external focus based for sure yeah yeah you kind of it's that's another one of those there. things you kind of get a two for one right mm. um <laughs> it, it, you both and i know 
I know there's been a few people that have tried to, I think like Keith Loesch and, and, and um, a few people have tried to tease apart information and fo ex external fo like focus of attention, mm -hmm. right? When you look at something, obviously you're getting both that, those things. So uh, you're right. It's hard to, yeah, I've kind of like, you know, played around with this in baseball and I, I found the same thing as you just described. People are not aware where they look. Um, very, very often they think they're doing one thing. Um, but we, you know, I, I started out with the same, like, okay, I'll, I'll be able to tell them you should be looking here. But now I, we use it more like uh, kind of as a, like diagnostic. And, you know, the, if we see persons not on the ball when it's released or something, then we might add like occlusion training in practice mm. to try to add a constraint to maybe motivate them to, do change without telling them what, right? Um, and see if it helps their their hitting. But you're right; it's it's um, if you don't accept, there's one kind of ideal <laughs> gaze pattern. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, I think, you know, as a, obviously you had to kind of break it down into, um, you know, the the the, the, the quiet I started the movement and but I really like the, the kind of the thinking of as a continuous thing um, I know there's been some really nice work showing that even after they like a dive and a penalty kick goalkeepers adjust <laughs> you know prospectively yeah. on based on the ball right to, um, so I think that there's some interesting stuff there but um, so are you are do you have more kind of uh, of this planned or are you you just sick of working with eye trackers <laughs> you you want to I I have moved away from from goalkeeping because mm. it's it's just it's just been football generally is just so tough to to get in and do experimental research just because of how strong the organisational demands are. So mm. my PhD instead is is moved into cricket. Okay. Um, it's slightly easier to control, and the training environments are slightly easier to embed myself in, particularly with batting because mm -hmm. it's a more structured training environment. Um, so my PhD is it's trying to somehow incorporate the, the, the quiet eye and picking up kind of visual material information with non-specifying information. So things like context and situational variables okay. um, and, and trying to bridge between them to see if there's some kind of effect around does intentionality constrain visual search behaviors. Okay. So but as of yet, yeah. I'm not into that particularly. I'm not, I've not got too far in yet because it's yeah, theoretically proving more difficult than, than <laughs> I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, um, that's a tough one. The, you know, the intention is kind of a, uh, mm. uh, sometimes it's just a bin. We throw a lot of things in, in the ecological <laughs> without really getting too specific. So um, no, that sounds cool. That, you know, that's kind of what I, the way I, been thinking too of these these variables that we typically think of are generating a prediction as more as constraints i think it mm. is a good way to, to think about it yeah um yeah that but that that's because you're going to kind of look at uh batter at different uh where batters look before yeah yeah i'm, I'm hoping hoping to see in some respect that if the situation of 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 how they're batting to so say they might be in a run chase or they might be trying to set a score or they might have you know one wicket left before they lose or they might be at the start of an innings and to see how that plays around with one how they kind of approach the game mm -hmm. whether they're more aggressive or more defensive and then see if that changes how they're trying to pick up visual information and and see if there's some kind of almost multimodal information link we can start to create. Cause I think intentions are, yeah, you're definitely right. So we've, we've probably skipped over a bit quickly. <laughs> and I think for, for things like training design, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's massively important, particularly in things like cricket and also I assume ba uh, baseball as well, where mm -hmm. we tend to just train in constant blocked environments without consequence or without context. And, you know, in cricket batting training, for example, you normally get yourself in a net and you'll just bat until kind of you're done. And whether you, you know, lose wickets or not is, is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So how is that 
actually transfer into performance when we're training in this almost like a bubble where there's no yeah. periphery information whatsoever. But then we go into a performance environment and all of a sudden we've got to get a certain amount of runs in a certain amount of number of balls and the field around us keeps changing and the mm-hmm. bowlers are a bit very deliberate of how they're trying to bowl. And I think it's, it's an entirely different animal, but that as of yet is relatively unpicked. Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree. <laughs> uh, the, you know, we, we, we do can tend to ignore. So, so do you kind of think, you think like, just like a movement pattern or movement solution is individualized based on individualized constraints and things that the gaze strategy we come up with, they're kind of going to merge. Maybe they emerge simultaneously, (laughs) like, you know, uh, or there's a way that we can shape them as a coach. Like it'll be interesting to see um, kind of where people go from, from here with these ideas. Yeah. One thing that that's really kind of plagued me is, been how yeah how do we come to have those those kind of perception action couplings Mm -hmm. uh, at that point and whether that's based on sporting history or what they've been coached or Mm -hmm. it might be around their action capabilities i mean for me kind of from an anecdotal perspective i i retired from from playing football when i was 21 and i was a, a relatively decent kind of goalkeeper and i i played a game on pitch for a friend of mine a couple of years ago. So it had been about four years since I stopped playing and I, I was still calibrated to, to picking up kind of information that, that previously would have afforded me to go intercept the tap, intercept the mm-hmm. board or whatever. But I was just so kind of uncalibrated to my new <laughs> body, which was plagued of injuries mm-hmm. and, and much heavier and I was trying to charge around the pitch in my, in like in my head going, I, was like, I should have, I should have got that. But, <laughs> my body's like four seconds behind me so yeah there's there's something there in terms of those immediate kind of i guess local constraints that affect our performance and affect sure. what we're trying to perceive and the affordances that that become most relevant to us mm-hmm. and yeah h- how we actually understand and measure that which is why i find so much value value in the ecological approach that the, the way it explains how we come to pick up certain information i think is far more telling particularly for the quiet eye than perhaps traditional cognitivist models have been so far. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I, I think change in gaze behavior is probably one of the main ways we adapt. <laughs> we can adapt mm. to changing in task constraints, right? Or yeah. individual constraints, you know, as I get slower, you know, and hitting batters lose bat speed and get slower. You know, one of the ways you can compensate is looking different places and you know and so I, I think that's a really interesting way example of maybe you need to, things are they're not aligned they're not cali- they're right, calibrated yeah. it's a perfect word right your gaze strategy and your movement <laughs> technique and movement solution are not just calibrated so yeah well that's really that's really uh interesting work ben thanks for uh joining me today i really that was a fun to talk about i haven't read anything on the quiet eye in a, in a while so it was nice to catch up on it uh, thanks so much for yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.ed or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWeights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to Patreon.com forward slash PerceptionAction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away